leadership. You only put the power in the hands of the administration. My instincts are a big part of it. That's been the thing that's gotten me to where I am. This is a frivolous lawsuit, and we believe Hunter Biden's attorneys know this. I want there to be a Democrat that is competent for all four years. I think he's too old to be president right now. Like, he doesn't know what's going on right now. Hello, I'm Nicole Killian in Washington, and welcome to America Decides. We have a lot to get to tonight, with five Americans freed in a prisoner swap with Iran, a new CBS News poll on a possible Biden-Trump rematch, and Hunter Biden filing a lawsuit against the IRS, and, of course, the looming government shutdown. A group of House Republicans has struck a short-term deal to keep the government funded through the end of October. It includes temporary budget cuts of around 8 percent for most agencies, excluding the Defense Department and Veterans Affairs. My colleague, CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarland, joins us now. And, Scott, before we get to the funding fight on Capitol Hill, I first want to discuss today's prisoner swap between the U.S. and Iran. Let's take a listen to Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and we'll talk on the other side. Today, their freedom, the freedom of these Americans for so long unjustly imprisoned and detained in Iran, means some pretty basic things. It means that Husbands and wives, fathers and children, grandparents can hug each other again, can see each other again, can be with each other again. The administration, of course, is celebrating this hostage release. How are lawmakers reacting? Obviously, there's a universal opinion that this is a good outcome, but there's deep concern about what was done to bring this good outcome. Republican leader Mitch McConnell says this deal to bring home these prisoners could incentivize future hostage taking. And the reaction from House Republicans, Senate Republicans, House Democrats and Senate Democrats kind of falls right down traditional party lines. Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut said this was a good result brought about by the Biden administration returning these American detainees. Senator Shelley Moore Capito says it was a good result brought about the wrong way. It seems clear, Nicole, as this evening began in Washington, this is going to trigger some congressional investigations, either from the House Foreign Affairs Committee, from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. There's enough concern about what was done to bring about this release that this seems likely, if not imminent, to trigger oversight. And turning back to domestic politics, House Republicans, as we mentioned, just unveiled this new short-term spending plan. But it seems as soon as it was unveiled, it got shot down. So what is the current state of play? I think the best indication we got, Nicole, came late today when one of the authors of this one-month continuing resolution to avert a government shutdown said, in so many words, invariably there will be a shutdown. Even the authors of this bill recognize this is likely come September 30th. That was Chip Roy of Texas. We asked the House Speaker uh, late today what he made of some of the Republicans <laughs> dissenting on this bill. Some of the conservative members of the Freedom Caucus say they're a no on this likely Republican-only bill. Take a listen to his response to that and my question about whether Democrats will be involved. This isn't the 30th. We've got a long ways to go. We've got a lot of different ideas. I, I credit our members over the weekend working together from the Freedom Caucus to the uh, uh, Main Street. They put up with an idea. Uh, I'm, I'm for a lot of different ideas. Whatever gets us to be able to get through, and I'll continue to put more ideas on the floor. Any outreach to Leader Jeffries at this point? I talk to Jeffries a, a lot of times about what's going on here, but inside our conference, we can work on this. And we can Bottom line remains the same as it has been this entire Congress. Republicans can lose only four votes, and there are several House Republicans who say they are firm no's. There's no Democratic votes likely to find on this bill. In fact, one interesting note from the afternoon session, Anna Polina Luna, the House Freedom Caucus member from Florida, Nicole, who just gave birth and has suffered a four-day treatment regimen for an infection and for a fever, says she'll get on a plane and fly back here to vote no if she has to. She's that adamant against her own party's plan. You know, I know you asked the speaker about his conversations with a leader, Jeffries. I know uh, congressional Democrats don't really seem too eager uh, to get on board uh, with what House Republicans are proposing. But at the end of the day, is it inevitable that speaker is going to have to cut a deal with Democrats in order to get something passed? 
going to have to cut a deal with the Senate Democratic leader, the White House, if not Democrats in his own chamber. At some point, there has to be bipartisan work to get anything past the finish line, signed into law, to keep the lights on, keep the doors open. And as we're about to find out this week, Nicole, we'll see how much this week is defined by Kevin McCarthy's future. Calls for him to be vacated or removed from speakership if he does do outreach to Democrats to get past this funding deadline. There's already been calls for a motion to vacate from Florida Republican Matt Gates. Quite likely the calls increase if he cuts some deal with Democrats before the deadline. And on that front, uh, you know, the speaker is also facing pushback from others within his conference today. We saw Congresswoman Victoria Sparks issuing a very critical statement saying, quote, the Republican House is failing the American people again and pursuing a path of gamesmanship and circus. You know, this was actually a statement that was amplified as well by Congressman Gates. Could the speaker's gavel be in jeopardy? Even by Matt Gates' standards, Nicole, I have noticed an increase in the volume and the vitriol of his criticisms of Kevin McCarthy over the past few days, today included, indicative of potentially what he senses is a growing chorus of House Republicans who are scrutinizing Kevin McCarthy at this moment on this vote and this bill. This deadline is 12 days away, and it feels like a trigger point, a pivotal moment, an inflection point. For Kevin McCarthy. He's going to have to work with Democrats to keep the government open and just doesn't seem to be an appetite among House Freedom Caucus members for him to do so. Something's got to give. And then very briefly looking ahead to later in the week, we know Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is expected to meet with senators Thursday. Are there any plans for him to meet with lawmakers in the House? We asked Kevin McCarthy that question this afternoon. Does he expect to meet with Volodymyr Zelensky? He said yes. Whether the House Republican Conference or the entire House chamber gets to meet with Zelensky is a different story. There's obviously a lot of dissenting voices in the House chamber. The continuing funding for Ukraine among the House Republican Conference, whether they are given a full audience with Vladimir Zelensky remains to be seen. But Speaker McCarthy says he plans to meet with Zelensky midweek. All right, Scott McFarland, it's sure to be a busy week this week on the Hill. Uh, thanks so much. Same to you. Hunter Biden has filed a lawsuit against the IRS alleging privacy violations. The complaint cites an IRS whistleblower's interview on CBS News, as well as with other outlets. CBS News senior investigative correspondent Catherine Herridge joins us now. And Catherine, you know, what has been the reaction from the whistleblower's legal team? Well, Nicole, the 27-page lawsuit against the IRS alleges a failure by the agency to safeguard Hunter Biden's confidential tax return information and unlawful disclosure of that information by the IRS whistleblowers who testified to Congress and gave media interviews, including to CBS. Tristan Levitt is on the whistleblower's legal team. This is a frivolous lawsuit, and we believe Hunter Biden's attorneys know this. Neither Special Agent Shapley nor we as his attorneys have ever released any confidential taxpayer information other than through the statutory process that Congress established for whistleblowers to make disclosures. Once Congress releases that testimony, then like every American citizen, Gary Shapley has a right to discuss that public information. And so neither he nor we as his attorneys will be intimidated from doing so. There are strict laws governing the protection of taxpayer information. Did the IRS whistleblowers violate the law with their disclosures? No, absolutely not. So Section 6103 of the tax laws, which are found in Title 26, governs that confidentiality. But the same Congress that wrote the law also wrote itself an exception to receive whistleblower disclosures through particular committees. So that's why we went to the committees that we did. An IRS spokesman told CBS News they're not going to comment on this pending litigation, Nicole. Hunter Biden's lawyers also laid out more than a dozen specific incidents in this lawsuit, including interviews with CBS News, which, of course, uh, you first broke uh, some of these IRS whistleblower allegations. How are the lawyers responding to those specific claims? Well, in addition to the alleged privacy violations, the lawyers for the president's son went further, claiming it seemed personal. I have a copy of the lawsuit right here, and in the lawsuit, Hunter Biden's lawyers allege that the IRS agents have targeted and sought to embarrass Mr. Biden via public statements to the media in which they and their representatives disclosed confidential information about a private citizen's tax matters. Was that their intent? 
What the whistleblower has highlighted is not about Hunter Biden. It's about Justice Department processes. It's about conflicts of interest between the president of the United States and his appointees who did not recuse themselves at key decisions in the case and others who stopped investigative avenues from being followed. So that's the information that the whistleblowers wanted to bring to Congress. Asked about recent closed door testimony by other FBI and IRS employees who blamed the slow progress of the five-year investigation on bureaucracy and not political pressures, Lovett pointed to the fact that some testimony backed up the whistleblower claims that charges against Hunter Biden were denied in D.C. and California. In other words, that those U.S. attorneys declined to work with then U.S. Attorney David Weiss to bring the charges. And of course, David Weiss has since been elevated to be special counsel. All right. Well, thank you so much, Catherine Harridge, for your continued reporting on this. Special counsel Jack Smith is requesting a narrow gag order on President Trump. We'll tell you why next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Special counsel Jack Smith is seeking a narrow gag order to prevent former President Trump from attacking prosecutors, judges, and witnesses involved in his federal 2020 election interference case. The former president has repeatedly lashed out at his legal opposition in interviews and on social media. He has singled out numerous potential witnesses by name, including Georgia officials, involved in his state trial. CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa joins us now. And Bob, you know, what more do we know about this potential gag order and how is the former president responding? The former president is taking no caution when it comes to his public remarks about prosecutors or special counsel Jack Smith. In fact, Nicole, based on my conversations with Trump associates today, he is only likely to ratchet up his rhetoric in the coming weeks, especially as he faces a looming trial in Georgia and, of course, with these federal indictments. For former President Trump, this is political war, not just a legal war. That's how many of his advisors have put it to me in recent days. And you're looking now at a campaign that, while it is facing all of this incoming legally, still believes it can win the Republican nomination. Yeah, well, in terms of that legal war that you just mentioned, uh, we know the former president is getting a lot of attention for this interview that he had over the weekend. Uh, let's take a listen to uh, some of what he had to say about some of his upcoming criminal trials. When you go to bed at night, do you worry about going to jail? No, I don't, really. I don't even think about it. I'm built a little differently, I guess, because I have had people come up to me and say, how do you do it, sir? How do you do it? Uh, I don't even think about it. Uh, these are corrupt people that I'm dealing with. They're destroying our country. I mean, this was a very lengthy interview. You have interviewed the former president a number of times as well. I mean, what jumped out at you? Well, NBC's Kristen Welker, who I've reported alongside on the campaign trail for many years, uh, she spoke to President Trump at length at his Bedminster, New Jersey golf course, and they talked about the state of the campaign. And you see reflected in this interview much of the defiance you see in Trump on the campaign trail, although he is now being prosecuted for taking America democracy to the brink in the final days of his administration uh, by having all these meetings with lawyers. Uh, the prosecutors at the federal level and the state level believe there was criminal intent and many of those conversations and Trump's drive to stay in power to prevent the certification of Joe Biden's election. And you see in the interview over the weekend on Meet the Press, a, a Trump who's processing all of this, but as he just told Kristen Welker in that clip, he's someone who's not really thinking about the possible consequences down the line. And prison would be something down the line, because regardless of what happens with convictions, should they ever happen for Trump in the coming months or year, uh, his lawyers have already said he's certain to appeal, and this is going to be a protracted fight, to say the least. You know, the former president also said that he made the decision to challenge the 2020 election. Want to take a listen to that portion of the interview. As to whether or not I believed it was rigged, oh, sure. I, okay. I, it was my decision. So could this potentially complicate his legal defense, particularly in these two cases that are censured on the election, both in Georgia and federally? 
may help the lawyers who are arguing that Trump was driving this and not them, that they were offering legal advice. Uh, if you're John Eastman or Ken Chesborough, you may say to yourself now, well, Trump's on record now in this NBC interview, not under oath, but at least publicly saying his decision to move forward with a lot of these ideas and strategies was his own. But what Trump said just now in that clip is backs up my own reporting and others reporting that it was Trump who was the piston for all of these efforts in the final days of the administration. It was Trump. Well, that's what he seems to be acknowledging. Well, he, and I, re I remember reporting on in November of 2020 when some people were saying maybe it's time to concede, maybe it's time to walk away, go back to Mar-a-Lago. He said, no, we're fighting it in the courts. And then when they lost in the courts, they decided to fight it in the with by weaponizing the vice presidency. And then just very, very briefly, while we are talking about Georgia, obviously uh, this week several of the defendants in that case are pushing to have their cases moved out of Fulton County into federal court. Uh, we know Mark Meadows uh, initially tried this as kind of faced some setbacks here. So uh, what kind of chance do some of these other defendants stand? Based on my conversations with lawyers, there is a possibility that some of this might be elevated to a federal level because it's complicated to be facing similar charges at a state level and a federal level at the same time. There's nothing to say that it can't happen. Uh, you are, you're allowed to be prosecuted in different ways simultaneously. But we're really going to have to pay attention to what federal judges decide in the coming weeks. This is really going to take a few federal judges saying, we want these cases versus it happening in Georgia. But as you know, having covered Fonnie Willis, the district attorney down there for a while, she doesn't want to give any of this up. And so Georgia is moving forward rapidly. I know the former president has suggested he may go that route, too. So to be continued, Bob Costa, thanks as always Thank for being with us. New CBS polling shows a Biden-Trump rematch in a dead heat. We break down the numbers next year streaming America Decides. We're going to win. I think we're going to win an election the likes of which nobody's ever seen before. I don't think anything's going to stop it. Nothing's going to stop it. Because people see what's happened to our country. Welcome back to America Decides. That was former President Trump remaining confident about his chances in 2024. A new CBS News poll is giving us an idea of what a potential rematch between him and President Biden could look like. Our poll shows Trump holding a one-point lead over the president among likely voters. These results are within the margin of error. Anthony Salvanto and Bo Erickson join us now. Anthony is CBS News' executive director of elections and surveys, and Bo is a CBS News White House reporter. Anthony, I want to start with you. Walk us through some of your key findings. Uh, hey, Nicole. Look, for starters, it's the economy driving a lot of that. You see people who say that they're not financially as well off as they were before the pandemic, and I think that's the important dividing line for people well, they're going more for Donald Trump. So that's number one. But I want to put the whole race in context here for people. It's not necessarily a race that people suggest they want, they want to see. Um, we asked, how would a rematch like this make you feel? And nearly two-thirds says it would make them feel like the political system was broken. Um, and then another third actually come down a little bit on primary voters that we've been following and polling in other areas and that they're out of touch. So that sort of sets the context. It's very early, but that's where people start, Nicole. Yeah, well, I really want to drill down on that graphic because what jumped out at me are the 8%, 8 percent, <laughs> eight single digits who think that either President Biden or the former president are the best candidates. I mean, what does that say about the state of the 2024 race? Um, what it tells you is people say there is a lot at stake. It's the flip side of you know, saying that the system is broken if, in their minds, it produces these candidates. But the other thing I would add is, as much as they think democracy is at stake, the rule of law is at stake, they also think it, that's only going to be safe. Democracy is only going to be safe if their guy wins, Nicole. And, Bo, you know, I know you talked to some Democratic voters in Pennsylvania about the president heading into 2024. 
What was the sentiment on the ground? Well, this is a really key area of southeastern Pennsylvania. It's where President Biden has to run up the score again with a lot of Democratic voters in order to be able to win the state again in 2024, maybe against former President Trump, if that is that rematch happening. And what I heard a lot talking to these Democratic voters is that they have some concerns about President Biden's age. He's 80 years old and if he's tough enough. So we can actually listen to how they describe some of these concerns. I think he's too old to be president right now. I think he could do better. I think he's trying, but he's not, he's, he's not strong enough. Like, he needs to put his foot down a little bit more. I want there to be a Democrat that is competent for all four years. And so talking to these voters, when you hear them talk about age, when you talk a little bit more about them, it kind of seems like age is like a proxy for health. They're concerned about the president's health and his future health. And it should be noted that the White House doctor has given Biden a clean bill of health. He calls him a healthy, vigorous 80-year-old. But some of these concerns that they were saying, other people said that the president seemed feeble. Another Democrat said, like, President Biden could use a monster energy drink. So we'll see, maybe he'll start drinking those. Uh, but one solution that they said is that they need to see more of President Biden out to kind of prove some of his skeptics wrong if they do have those concerns. And Anthony, very briefly, I mean, I know the poll uh, that you conducted also touches a bit on the age issue. It also uh, touches on uh, Democrats' feelings uh, with respect to defending democracy. What else did you find? Well, let me pick up on that word you heard there, tough, right? Now, Joe Biden gets described as calm, predictable, all things that helped him in 2020, but tough is not very high on this list. What does that mean for Democrats, since we're talking about them in particular, very briefly? Well, what I want to show you is that Democrats think that not only will democracy be in danger if Biden doesn't win, but that four in ten of them think he's not being tough enough towards Republicans. Those two things connect, right? If they see a danger and they want someone who they perceive is tougher, then that's not meeting their, what they want in a president at the moment. Maybe that stirs a little bit of concern, Nicole. Yeah, and uh, speaking of qualities uh, with respect to the various candidates, there also has been a lot of talk, Bo, about what role a Vice President Harris could potentially play on the campaign. Let's play some more of what voters told you about that in Pennsylvania, and we'll get your reaction on the other side. She's too quiet. She's not, you know, she's not standing like she should stand. You know what I mean? Um, I feel like she has a lot more in her that we're not hearing. Um, I feel like she's being silent or she's kind of, you know, worried about, you know, what she can say and what she cannot say. I really thought that she would have a more prominent role and we would see more of her, especially for um, the young girls in school uh, as a role model. It's really not necessary to always be in the headlines. You know, you still can get a lot of work done behind the scenes, you know, so I don't worry that we don't hear a lot from our VP. And, of course, the administration and the campaign continues to defend uh, the vice president's uh, role. But what else did you hear from voters on the trail? So these voters may be to be expected. These are Democrats. So they are actually supportive of Vice President Harris. And they noted that vice presidents don't usually have center stage when it comes to these re-election campaigns. But that word that we heard from the first woman there, silence, that is a word that several people brought, brought up to me. And I thought that was really interesting and maybe a tell for maybe a future problem for the campaign. But it, did most of the voters you talked to, I mean, did they feel that she still is the best running mate for the president? Yes, they did. They, they really still wanted her on, on the ticket here, but they want to hear more from her and they want her to really latch on to some of these big ticket issues. All right. Well, Bo Erickson, thanks so much for your coverage on the trail. Of course, more to come. That does it for us today here on America Decides. You are streaming CBS News.